Hello and welcome to another in our series of In Our Tax Times, a series of conversations with senior and influential figures in the tax profession. I'm John Whiting and the aim of this series is to talk to people who've helped shape part or indeed the whole of the uh, system that so many of us work in as a tax profession or indeed of course as a technicality, as a tax technical area. And today I'm delighted to be able to welcome Bruce Sutherland, somebody who Bruce can be described as the guru of a particular area and I'm referring to valuations of course and one of the few people who can uh, actually almost claim to have almost invented an area. Valuations Bruce. Now we'll probably be doing two programmes with you because you've got such a long and varied life in this world but let's focus on valuations but just to begin at the beginning, how did you get involved in tax and business in the first place? Completely by accident, totally unintended. Right. I started life as a soldier. Mm -hmm. I was in the old Indian Army and I was privileged to serve with one of the oldest regiments, the first Gurkha Rifles, founded incidentally exactly 200 years ago, same time as Waterloo. Right. But of course in 1947 uh, we gave India away and they didn't want Brits as officers in their army. So I had to work for my living instead. I always thought General Sir Bruce Sutherland would look jolly good, but it was not to be, and so what do I do? My stepfather was a friend of a, a partner in one of the two big firms in Nottingham, where we had lived at one time. And I was talked into becoming an article clerk. A, a lot older, of course, most article clerks, straight from school, 17, 18. Here am I, 25, starting on this. So that's what I did. Well, of course, it was terribly important. My, my you didn't get paid much as article, mm. Clark. It was most important, I qualified, so I worked very hard, and to my and everybody else's surprise, first certificate of merit, my intermediate exam. Very good. First article clerk in Nottingham to get a first certificate of merit since Sir Harold Howitt, then Harold Howitt, 40 years before. You know, he became senior partner of Pete's, president of the Institute, you name it. So all over the front page of the papers, you name it. And the firm were very pleased, and their old senior partner, Sir Charles, said, well done, my boy, he gave me a special cheque, five pounds. Now, that, of course, would be about 200 pounds today. Yeah and uh, said, now, is there anything we can do for it? So I said, yes. One of the papers in which I didn't get a plender prize, which you know you got for coming first in any paper, was taxation. I've never even seen a tax comp. I've spent all my time on audits in my 18 months today, because if you'd been in the services, you only had to serve three years instead of five year articles. Oh, right home. So I was given a little office at the top of this huge office building all the files and everything for the tax of all the furniture companies in the Great Universal Stores Group. Great Universal Stores is one of the giant companies, probably yes. one of the top 50 companies. Yes. And the biggest part of it was the furniture stores. In every town and city there was a big shop selling furniture, mostly on hire purchase. And the whole of the tax computations and agreements on these had been left open from 1938 through to 1948, where well, I was starting on this in 49. Partly because there was a big argument about how you value high purchase debt. So with, as they did with the shortage of staff in the war, they put it all on one side, and now it all had to be cleared up. So I had to learn about income tax on companies, because there was no corporation tax then, of course. Of course. National Defence Contribution, which was a sort of company surtax which started in the mid-30s when we started rearming for the war. Excess profits tax during the war, and then from 1945 onwards, profits tax, which was a two-tier tax, a higher rate on distributed profits than on retained profits. And I can tell you, by the time I took my final, I did nothing else but tax, by the time I took my final exam, I was a guru on company taxation, I can assure you. So that's how I got into tax. So that's how you got into tax, and obviously you did that for quite a while. 
Uh, and yes, and you indeed. told us a bit of... And then I moved on, of course, from that firm, and that's, um, it wasn't until later I got involved in valuation. So. Well, let's get on to valuation, because as I say, that's what I yeah. want to make the focus well, of this discussion. What some, took you to that? Some three years later, by this time I'm, what, 31. Mm -hmm. Incredibly young to be a partner in a firm of Charles de Cartier. I became a partner in one of the old firms in Birmingham. It, it wasn't a giant firm, but it was, had a very, very upmarket practice. Nothing but quoted companies and big, uncreated companies and rich people, landowners, you name it. And uh, a peer of the realm who was extraordinarily rich, he had married an American heiress and his father had married an American heiress, which was quite popular in those days in the... Um, <laughs> nobility to restore the family fortunes. Of course. And this chap had died not long before. Now, most of the big land estates had uh, solicitors, not the big city firms, they wouldn't touch it. It was firms in Bedford Row around that sort of area, but not this family. They used the family solicitors in a little town in the middle of one of their big estates. Mm -hmm. And this solicitor was quite useless. And everything was left to my senior partner, who was really the Earl's right-hand man. So when, after the death, SV, Shares Valuation Division, sent to the solicitor the normal letters starting the valuation process, they were all handed over to my partner. And he said, well, I don't know, here you are, this new young partner, me, you better deal with this. And so I had to learn about share valuation. The so again, ver sounding like very much self-taught. Oh yes, oh indeed. The, the, well, the, there was only one place where share valuation was taught was in shares valuation division. It was right. the only place anywhere. They taught their own people, and very well, I may say, in those days. So the only place you could find out about it was in Diamond's Death Duties and Green's Estate Duties, mm -hmm. the two big publications, one by Butterworth and the other by written, in effect, by the Estate Duty Office. They're all Estate Duty Office senior people. Excellent books, wonderful stuff, very well written. So I read all this, got hold of copies of all the cases, a lot of law, had them, of course, no photocopies in those days, mm -hmm. had them copied and uh, typed up and so on. I've still got that collection of copies of all these cases and right. um, taught myself and devised a, a suitable form of valuation to include all this. And I started to put this into shares valuation. The first, I can only remember the first one I put in, and I got an astounded letter back. Thank you so much for this extremely well presented da 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 da. I could argue with you about the multiple and this and that, but no, I'm happy to agree. And for the first few years, all my valuations were agreed by return. Yes went through. So, I was I mean, the great expert. Were you really the first person in the profession then to really do well, valuations? I mean, people Well, there was one man, there was a chap called Tom Hamilton Baines, yes. who was a senior partner in MP Cudworth, another Birmingham firm mm. in and I knew Tom well. He got interested and he wrote a little book, which is a delightful book, but not really great help if you're learning the thing. And Tom did a bit. But to see the thing, well, accountants weren't involved. No. Share valuation was only required for estate duty, very, very rarely for stamp duty. On a company or a reorganisation, so you might require estate duty. Of course, it was handled, handled by solicitors. Yes, of course. Put in the probate papers, and there it is: the list of holdings in unquoted companies and quoted companies, for that matter. Passed over the shares valuation division, you check the quoted ones, of course, stock exchanges, but the others, they had a standard bug letter was sent to the solicitors, five, three years' accounts, memorandum and articles, nature of the trade, any transactions in the last three years before or after the death. And that was it. All that was answered, and then they would look at it, ask for more information. And at the end of the day, they would say, well, we think the value is this which was usually lower than the family thought it was. We were talking about the basis of valuation mm. later, but um, lower than that. I'd usually be agreed, and that was it. So, so accountants weren't really involved, and I suppose, yeah. yes, I was a pioneer in that sense. 
And of course, you've described these early days, and I presume we're talking the 50s, perhaps? Well, this is the 50s, yes. Yeah. I think my first one was probably 54. Yeah, and sort of going to the 60s of very gentlemanly and simple. Well, were you actually I involved in arguments of evaluations at this not stage? Not a great deal, no, because I knew what I was doing. And they were very good in those mm. days. Not to, today, a different matter, but they were very, very good. They respected what I... Because I, I did what was required for evaluation for tax purposes. There was no argument about it. Yeah. And yes. uh, I, I got... The word spread around a little that I was doing it, so I got an occasional case, occasionally from the big firms of accountants. Mm -hmm. Your old firm, I had a case I I'm remember sure. sometime in the 50s, because they knew nothing about it either. And the shares valuation division would occasionally refer somebody and say, well, I think we think you ought to go and consult Bruce Sutherland. So it was not enough to make a living, but it was a sideline in the practice. So it did begin to be quite a bit of your practice work then? Yeah, but not enough to live on at that time. Mm -hmm. That was not until capital gains tax came along. Well, that leads me into my question. When did it really start to take well, that's off? And you're going to say capital gains tax then? In As the I say, until 1965, it purely said you very, very rarely share the stamp duty. Mm. In all the case law, there is one case on stamp duty, which I think is sometime in the 20s. That's all. Right. In 1965, of course, along comes the capital gains tax. Instead of just death, every disposal where the shares had not been acquired at arm's length, either uh, they'd been inherited or gifts or whatever, had to value for the acquisition cost. Mm -hmm. And then if the disposal wasn't at arm's length, you had to value for the disposal cost. And of course, if the disposal was death, well, of course, death wasn't a charge capital gains tax, but no, it, it, well, somebody was acquiring it then. So, of course, the market greatly increased. Shares valuation division, of course, had to recruit a lot of extra people mostly from the inspectorate, mm -hmm. and usually of quite good quality in the first days. And that, of course, did increase. In the autumn of 1965, the Institute of Child Accounts did the thing they'd never done before. They ran some technical courses to teach their members. They'd never done it before. Right. To teach their members. Courses were a rarity before this. Uh, there weren't any bodies running courses like there are today and so they were a rarity. Um, and the, uh, they ran these courses. The most boring part I've ever had as a lecturer. You had four courses, and they each ran one day after the one before. Quite big. They were there in the, the Metropole Hotel in Brighton was where they held them, and put the overflow people in the hotel next door. So 100 people, 200 people, whatever, uh, each course. And you did the same lecture day after day after day to what looked just another crowd charmed accountant. It looked exactly the same. <laughs> it was the most, and I lectured, of course, on capital gains tax, on which I'd become an expert, because I'd been involved, as we may discuss later, in representational work, mm. and, of course, on valuation. And following that, of course, I was invited to lecture to every district society of the Institute up and down the country on share valuation. And I used to say half day or whole day courses all over the country, on the side, which of course then the work flowed in. Anyway, we joined Touche, and Touche had this international connection. And so it was a new world now mm. in the accountancy profession. And well, it was, wasn't it? I mean, I remember well, coming I, in. I, the I, I, I had a bad illness in what, 66, 66, yeah, 66. And they said, well, you know, just take it easy. I said, well, you can't go on the field on a Saturday afternoon and say, you chaps pay harder. Mm. I think I'm well enough now in a share valuation to run my own place. So I retired. Luckily, some former clients offered me non-executive directorships. And then, my big moment, a quoted company, which owned some very well-known subsidiaries, manufacturing consumer durables, ran into losses. And one of the major shareholders, whom I had known in two, said, would I take, he was prepared to persuade the other major shareholders, institutional shareholders, to appoint me as 
managing as um, what you might call us a part-time chief executive chairman. Mm -hmm. So I took this marvellous experience. I went into this, and in four years, I turned it round to making four times the profit in real terms, forget inflation, it ever made before. Well done, bravo, Bruce Southern. And yeah. then I handed over to one of the famous professional che company chairmen of the time, because I wanted my share of annuation press was my main name. But I learned so much about business. About business and about yes. running companies and buying companies. So here I was in the share valuation, unique. When I, after I qualified, I'd had two years working as a chief accountant in industry. I'd been 13 years a partner in a substantial, later, major firm of accountants. I was a non-executive director of umpteen companies. I'd been a boss, in effect, of a large group of companies. My, I knew my share valuation law and practice better than anybody outside share valuation. What more can you want for a successful career as a guru in share valuation? <laughs> and this led you to set up, I mean, this is when you really set up your own firm yep. and, and got that rolling. And in fact, I had no difficulty. You go to work, work came off from all sides. In fact, one of the things that people forget today, from 19... 40, 41, through to 1979, the top rate of tax only fell below 90% mm. for three years, and then it fell to 98 and three quarter percent, or yeah. 88 and three quarter percent. The top rate of estate duty from 1948 on was 80%. Why that we had so little tax avoidance, and we didn't really, and those, I have no idea, but as far as I was concerned, once I got, I'm not greedy. So I worked probably not more than about two thirds of the time. The rest of the time I was working with representative bodies and uh, I had a lot of time at the Hockey Association, a certain amount of time at the Conservative, you name it. We'll come back to that mm. in a moment, perhaps, Bruce. But you, coming back to valuations mm. as the practice was developing and you obviously didn't have any trouble in getting the work mm -hmm. and whatever, and perhaps... And lecturing, getting, of course, don't forget and all And lecturing, yep. and of course, probably more contentious and more arguments building because, well, there's more expertise around. Well, what ha we, with Shares Federation, of course, they, they got less expert and people... Uh, to say, I, well, I got the feeling at one time that they were sort of... We've never, ever managed to persuade Sutherland to change evaluation, mm. which was true, except once when I, they pointed something I'd overlooked and I immediately changed my valuation because I wanted the right value. So you're saying basically there isn't so much argument. I mean, what's your recipe, what's your mantra then to avoid those arguments? Well, it isn't, it's just following the law. Mm -hmm. The value for tax purposes is not like the value in the real open market. It's the price that a prudent prospective person, not a gambler, a prudent prospective mm -hmm. person would pay for the shares. And that must be the worth to him on that day of the returns he can reasonably expect. Yep. The returns may take the form of dividends or, other ca or capital distributions or sale of, or winding up, whatever it may be, dispose of. For the purpose of dividends, then you look at the prospect for profits, the economic outlook for the country, for that trade, where the company fits in the trade, how it's done in the past. It's, it's asset based is not in that point terribly relevant, except as cover for the value we're going to arrive at. And you form a view of the likely profits and likely returns. Now, of course, in most sensible family company, they don't pay dividends. Yes, of course. So the returns, no. Pro are they likely to pay dividends? Never. So there's no. So then you have to fall back on what's the capital return. And that's where you turn to the next key thing, the Articles Association. What do they say? Most 
unquoted company articles provide for the tra- what you do for transfer of shares. Mm. And the typical sort of thing is any holder wishing to dispose of a share must first offer it to the other members at a fair price. Yep. Uh, occasionally, it may be that it's got to be approved by the judge, something like that, but that offer thing is very common, the preemption clause. And it depends on what that says about the fair price can have a big bearing on it. Mm-hmm. In any event, if supposing the fair price is, is a, a true market value, even then, do the other, are the other members likely to be interested to pay? Is anybody else likely to be? Would you buy minority All share? All these factors have to be brought in. Would you buy a minority yes. share in a company run by a family, completely free to do what they like, and you're just going mm. along, the value's like to be small. And so it's and all these factors that really have to be brought in, Bruce, that's and something it. I was definitely wanting to lead up to, which is, is valuation something that can ever be just a formula? And I suspect it you're isn't. saying com- anything Cannot but. Be. No two companies, no two people are the same. Yeah. Companies are collections of people. And the way they do things. I remember on one occasion I'd, I was, I'd, valued, I'd valued the shares of a company in a particular trade. And there was another almost identical. It was the same products, the same trade. And so, and this came my way. And the chapman room said, well, we valued that. Though. I said, no, no, no. First of all, they're different people. They've got different philosophies. But secondly, their manufacturing methods are different. The, and I won't weary you with the engineering things and so forth. But there were significant differences the way they acquired their raw material, the way they manufactured, and the way they distributed through wholesalers in the one case and the other case direct to and this sort of thing. And this is one of the advantages of having been in industry. You knew about these things. And then, of course, above all, the most important management. Management. You can have a wonderful company and if it top managers go, it can be straight yep. down. How do you judge management? Very interesting. I always, in a case where the decision at stake, would ask to go around at least one of the factories and so on, and smell the air, because that told you an awful One case, a very f- well-known company, extremely well-known, and I walked around in, in the middle of Birmingham, an engineering company, you know, it was the most peaceful place I've ever been. It was so calm and lovely. And all the workforce were white, not a black man amongst them. Mm. So I said to the director who was taking me, I said, how come in the middle of Birmingham? Well, the unions won't let us have them. So I knew then that that company was doomed to fail. Mm. It had no hope. Mm. You rally the shares of that, you, f- you forget it. That's the sort of things. The, which experience taught me, of course. And the old days shares value, they recognised this. They knew just as much about the law and practice because they were very, very good. They knew nothing about this. And they, and because I was an honest man and they knew it, they knew I wouldn't pull their legs. And so they listened they to me. They believe what you said. I mean, my very limited experience of valuations, I mean, so nowhere near yours, Bruce. I can certainly empathise with what you're saying. It can't be formulaic, no. and to that extent, I guess we're never going to get valuations out of the tax system because there's always going to be taxes well, on value at so, in some shape or form. You could, there? but it would be very unfair to taxpayers. Hmm. No, because of the same. You, it all depends on the same. So, bringing it all together into the current day, I mean, you're still very active in the field. Do you see? A need for more people to work oh, yeah. in valuations. Is this something you might recommend well, to somebody's child? It's, it's still a limited market. It's hmm. still a limited market, isn't it? Um, I suppose what about 15 years ago, something maybe more. A group of people who were leaders in the share valuation field. Some of them makes revenue, a few not. Set up a thing called the Society of Share and Business Values. Indeed. And they came to me and said, would I be their first chairman as, as, as the great value? So I went and talked with them and said, how many members would we like to get? And I said, well, in my opinion, I don't think there are 50 people in the country. I would 
have, because I've been around quite a lot mm. as members of this society. We obviously couldn't set exams and that sort of thing. So the way we admitted members was they had an interview panel, which I always, while I was chairman, chaired. And some very, very well-known people who thought they were absolutely cat's whiskers and I turned them down because they didn't really know it. They were bull merchants. Obviously, Bruce, it's kept you young and active <laughs> for so many years. And it's been absolutely fascinating to hear you talk about how you got into it and how you did very genuinely develop this, you, this, you very genuinely developed this niche specialism of valuations. I met a demand, I think is mm. the thing to say. There was no, there, there ought to have been, and I filled the gap. Well, for the moment, Bruce Sutherland, guru of the valuation world, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you indeed.